So to summarize what we've seen so far, we have seen um, well, block cipher and stream ciphers uh, in this part, but putting it into a larger context. So we have seen um, in the context of, of the internet, how Alice and Bob obtained a shared key using the diffie hellman key exchange, say on Edwards curve or on curve 2519. And then we have seen signatures. So with signatures, Bob is sure he's talking to Alice because he has verified her signature. So in the diffie hellman context, Alice would send her diffie hellman share signed by some long-term key that she has. And then Bob verifies that this is really from Alice, similarly on the, on the Alice side, of course, with Bob. And then they're computing the diffie hellman shared key, knowing that they're talking to the right person. Now, Alice can Bob uh, encrypt to Bob with symmetric key cryptography, and Bob can send to Alice as well. So we have seen there the block cipher, the stream ciphers, but well, we haven't really seen yet um, some important security feature, namely what happens when Eve messes with the ciphertext. And actually, Eve can mess with the ciphertext. When you look at stream cipher encryption, so with the stream cipher, you have that the encryption is while well, taking the stream, so that's the key K and the nonce N generated by some functions of cipher F. And then all it does is XOR the message to it. So this is a local operation. It's very efficient, of course, so that's nice. And also the decryption operation is then easy. The decrypting side computes the same part, the same function, the same K and the same nonce. X also ciphertext and well, okay, that means if you're doing the decryption of an encryption, the two parts from the stream cipher fall out. So these cancel to zero and you're left with the message. Now, if Eve is trying to mess around with this, she would send, she would stop the uh, communication and intercept the encryption of this one. She doesn't know what's in there. We've ensure this is a secure block uh, stream cipher. But then she adds some error to it, some Eve vector, some Eve string. Now, what happens with that in the decryption operation, when it gets to, uh, to Bob, then again, the parts of the streams are cancel out, the message is there, but also Eve's contribution. So Bob will decrypt this, not to the message that Alice had sent, but to the message that Alice had sent plus E. Now, if this was some scheduling of an appointment or if this was a bank transfer, well, maybe it doesn't really matter what the original message was, but it matters a lot that Eve can mess around with it. If Eve can change a bank transfer of a hundred euros to a billion euros and plus 100, well, she doesn't know it was a hundred at the bottom part, but she can change the top bits and, well, you probably don't have a billion euros sitting around. And even if she does it a little bit more subtly, like a thousand, you would be rather unhappy to send Bob a thousand something euros. Also, why do we even think this comes from Bob? So first of all, we need integrity protection, so not change the message, but also how can we how can we sure this came from Alice? I mean, Bob gets this message. Yes, he assumes it's from Alice, um, so he will apply the decryption, but this could just be some random garbage. It could be just some E, no encryption there at all, and that it encrypts to E plus whatever the message would have been. So it would have been, well, would be encrypting to, well, the ciphertext, the E plus this function. Some random gibberish, and maybe that's good enough for uh, Bob, uh, for Eve to mess things up. So we also want to have an authenticator. We want to have something which says, yes, this is really from Alice. Bob, you can be assured that nobody else could have sent this message. And so this brings us to the topic of this lecture, namely message authentication codes. So those achieve both the integrity protection and the authentication. So the title of the slides, Authenticated Encryption, is what we want to achieve in this overall thing. So we want to have full authenticated encryption from the public key system all the way down to the symmetric key system. And so what we're still missing is, well, what the functionality that's provided with the message authentication code. And this is super, super important. Never ever use encryption without authentication. There is no point in it. I mean, what a, how good is it that Bob uh, gets an encrypted message if he doesn't know that this is actually the message that Alice sent, 
and who doesn't even know that it's sent by Alice. Okay, so let's see a small example of a message authentication code. And this is going to be in the same vein as the real message authentication code I'm showing you. Um, if you were here for the batch doors lecture, then you would have seen um, authentication codes built with hash functions. This one is built with mathematics and has nice provable uh, properties. Um, unlike for block ciphers and string ciphers, we can actually do proofs about message authentication codes. So let me show you a nice one. This is due to Wegman and Carter. Okay, so we are fixing a prime, and you might have noticed already that I like the prime building of three. And then we assume that the sender and also the receiver know some secrets. There are five secrets, R1 to R5, which are less than a million, and then there are, well, a hundred, and that's just the number I pick out of my head, assume that they want to send a hundred message, messages. So these are secrets to a message, and these are secrets that will be used for each message. And these are, well, a bit smaller than the million three, they're just less than a million. And there will be a reason for that. Okay, so assume they both share these. And, well, in our big example of the internet, these would be just another thing you derive from a diffie hellman key exchange. So a diffie hellman key exchange gives you one key which you're going to use for encryption and going to give you these shared secrets that you will use for the message authentication code. Now, to send some ciphertext and, well, we always say message authentication code, but what we use it in, in modern cryptography is uh, we want to authenticate the ciphertext, so we want to give Bob a fast way to decide whether this is actually a valid ciphertext or not before Bob goes into, well, A, the effort of decrypting, and B, using his secret key on something which is maybe a tech crafted. Okay, so here we have these, um, well, one of those ciphertexts, and we assume that each ciphertext has five components. So each of those is a component less than a million. Okay, so we can send ciphertext up to 5 million. It's a constructed example to show you the, the pieces. We're going to get to cryptographic sizes in a little bit. Now, the authenticator that we're going to construct, or the authentication tag, is computed using these five message pieces together with these shared secrets and a message number. So the authentication tag for the ICE message. So we have to explicitly say this is on the ith message, so that then the receiver knows which SI to take. And so we're sending the ciphertext, the CI1 goes here, CI2 goes there, and so on. And then each C1 gets modified by R1, C2 gets modified by R2. And okay, so the here for this first part, the message number doesn't actually matter. The first block gets modified by R1, the second block by R2 third block by R5, uh, R3 until R5. Now this computation here is modular prime P. So this is modular a million and three. Okay, so at this point we're getting a number which is, well, between zero and a million and two. And what we do then is again one of those things which makes the mathematician a bit crazy, but is good for messing things up. Namely, we add this shared secret SI for the ICE message and we're adding this model just a million. Okay, the nice thing about this is that our authentication tag fits into the space of a million. So, well, six digits. And so the tag is just a six digit number and computed like this. And then when Bob gets this tag, he's, well, he gets a ciphertext, ciphertext is sent, tag is sent, and the message number is sent. And so with these, with these pieces, he can recompute the same information. So he knows the R1 to R5, he knows the, well, SI, which he takes from his long list there, and then he computes this thing. If the tag matches, it's a good message. If the tag doesn't match, it's a bad message. So if now Eve modifies the message, then, well, one of those pieces here would be different, and so there would be a contribution, say, from the second component, that's the R2, this would change, and since the CIs are up to a million, so CIs are up to a million, the RIs are up to a million, well, they would still introduce a difference mod P. 
So you can't modify the ciphertext and keep the tag. Now, if this is assuming that uh, Eve is starting with an existing authenticated message, Eve could now also try to just fake a message or fake a tag. So she could, oops, sorry, uh, she could just pick a random tag, but then, okay, well, there is one in a million chance that she gets this. I want to show one improvement to it, which is already getting towards how we can use it. Namely, instead of having five different pieces here, we can actually reduce this to just one piece there. So just one R and then one S for each message we want to send. And then we, um, instead of having different R's here, well, we still get different R I's, but we just get them by the powers. So the R is basically the R to the five, but the R five is just R, the R one is R to the four, the R, is R2 is R to the four, this is R one. So each R I is R to the power six minus I. So here you have the two links for comparison. The nice thing about this is that you can compute this using Warner's rule. So this is similar to how we've seen the square multiply at the double and add method. Um, the top one here gets the highest power because this is the first chunk of the ciphertext that we're seeing. So we're starting with this first chunk, multiply it by R, then add the next chunk, then multiply by R, etc., etc. Um, this has an R everywhere, so there is a final multiplication by R. Computing this whole thing mod P, which also means you can reduce mod P as you go, so you're never seeing numbers which are larger than a million three. And then once you're done with this computation, you add SI and you reduce mod a million. Okay, so security considerations. I'm going to do these on the polynomial version, but most of those also hold on the other one. The polynomial version is a little bit easy to see how some relationship works and well, gives you more math in the sense of the attacker power, but also more math on the proven things to say, okay, what are the probabilities of actually well, getting a forgery? Really. So the attacker can observe a whole bunch of those. So in the security analysis, we're assuming that the attacker can get those, or maybe they can even request those triples, so they're getting ciphertext, authentication tag and the I. And then the attacker's goal is to find a new one. So at least one of those pieces has to change. So it can be a totally random tag, or the ciphertext should be different. And well, the ciphertext has to be different, has to be not one of the ones you've seen already, but you could reuse the I, or you can reuse the tag. And it should hold that well, this I prime specifies which SI is being used. Um, the C prime is the ciphertext coming in. I'm using C of R as a shorthand for well, just the polynomial evaluation. So that is the, the first part gets multiplied by C to the R to the five, the second one by four, R to the four, etc. So just this polynomial. Same formula as right on the next slide. So the obvious attack is, well, you take the ciphertext you actually want to send, you pick some i and you pick a random uh, tag. And that's one I already said. Well, any tag has a chance one in a million of being the correct one. But you're actually losing some power there. You're not using anything from the, from the information you're given. And while well, knowing that there is this polynomial, you could actually um, improve your chances a little bit. So if you look at what happened in the mathematics here? So we have this as a formulation C prime of, uh, of R here. Um, you don't know what R is, but you can look at the polynomial C prime of X, and you can also look at all the ciphertext tuples or triples that you have seen um, and see whether you can see something nice about the ciphertext that you actually want to have authenticated and the ciphertext that you give, say, for C1. If you can find a C I or make C1 works, so that this polynomial factors completely modulo p, and that you can just test, um, then you improve your chances. Why is that? Well, if you're looking at these two examples, so C1, the legitimate ciphertext that you have seen the authenticator for, and then C prime is this one. So the first one has changed by one, and remember this gets multiplied by R to the five, 
these ones are still the same. And then this one, which gets multiplied by r2 squared, um, has a difference of 1. And here we have a difference of 25. If we're looking at this one and we factor it modulo nobody 3, then we're seeing, well, first of all, it has root 0. But r is not 0, so that's, well, that's not good. Then the other ones, there we have some chance of maybe r is 0. It would be a bit of an odd choice, but fine. We have five roots here. And so if we take the tag there, it would be good for each of these five choices of r. So instead of getting a 1 in a million chance, we're getting a 5 in a million chance. That's still pretty low. And again, the million is a small example. In reality, you would get a much bigger numbers there. So we have improved our success chance by 5 by searching a little bit and applying some mathematics. So we're searching for, well, we have our favorite ciphertext, and we're given some CIs there. We run through the list, or maybe we have several ciphertexts we like, and we find one so that this has five distinct roots. And then using reusing the tag gives us a one in chance, uh, gives us a fivefold chance. Actually, there's a little bit more because when you look at this equation, then you have here a reduction mod p and then the reduction mod a million. So here's a reduction mod a million three, and then you have some clashes. So if you would have that this number is actually larger. Than a million, a million, million one, million two, then this would get on the same number as before. So if we look at this polynomial that we just had there, the x to the 5 plus x squared plus 25, then this would also succeed for the um, r which is given here, because that is the root of this mod a million. Now, that is assuming one in three chase. That this has a fairly low probability. There's only three cases that this would hold. But if that's the case, then you would also have an extra chance. So that gives us six in a million. And it's really just six in a million because the other two polynomials do not factor. But in the worst case, this could also give you five different linear factors. Then you get up to 10 in a million. And actually, well, it could also be minus a million. So here is now the full polynomial. So you could have at most 15 roots of this polynomial. So this has degree 5, this has degree 5, this has degree 5. And all these three chunks, because of the first computing mod p and then mod a million, would actually be valid. But these ones with much, much lower probability because it requires that the value is even in this range. Okay, so now 15 out of a million is still not really scary. It's still a small number. And again, we can control this. Well, the degree comes from how many chunks of a message we're accepting. And then the million comes from how large the modulus is. And then the three comes from the, well, plus and minus. And the, well, going with plus, going with minus, so how often you could fit in there. Well. Could we still get better? So this was a small nitpick. So there's a bigger nitpick whether we could actually pick some different value. I mean, we now have these polynomials here. Um, and these are just saying, okay, well, you have to stick with the T1 or with the T2 that you're seeing. Um, could they just pick a different value? Could they just get better? And then if you look at this, well, in the view of polynomials, if you're taking a random tag, but C1, I mean, we have to fix which are you picking? So, okay, there was one message C1, which belonged to tag T1. And then you're picking this one as your I, and you're picking a different tag. Then, okay, you're just looking at this modified polynomial, or this polynomial, so that's where the million comes in, and that's the minus value. So, no matter which T prime you're picking, each of those gives you at most 15 roots. So, the combination, um, for each forgery attempt that the attacker does, they have at most a 15 in a million chance whether they pick an existing T1 or pick a T prime and say it's for one. So this, this bigger nitpick is just about whether we should pick T1 here when you go with one 
or we should pick a random T prime. Maybe a, a carefully crafted. I mean, I'm, I'm very careful to do this thing with the roots thing. Um, but no, it doesn't give us anything better. So we can maybe improve our chances of getting five factors if our C prime that we have never has five linear factors for any of the C's that we can look at. Then, yes, we can benefit from this, but at most 15. Okay, so last slide, but that takes a few overlays is actually a real-world example. So poly 5 is a message authentication code using this construction, as I said, due to Greg Minor Carter. Um, and now the uh, scaled-up versions, so the R now has 128 bits, so it's got a lot larger. Um, there is some change to it, so there are some bits cleared for spade, um, but they don't affect the analysis, except for, well, okay, the R has only 128 minus 22, so 200, uh, 106 bits of unknown values. Um, so we have to take this into account for the analysis. And then the computation is happening. The, the P, which was a value 3, is now 2 to the 130 minus 5. That's also where the 105, uh, 1305 comes from. So it's 2 to the 130 minus 5. And then the final result is taking more 2 to the 128. So the final result is 128. When you're doing this in the context of, okay, you have done your Diffie-Hama key exchange or you have some authentication keys sit around, then you're actually generating this R and the SIs from some master key in the round number. So it's not that you have to know in advance how many messages you're going to send and then go like, oh my god, I'm out, I have used all my 100. This is actually a, a procedure of how you generate more of those, but it also means it's a deterministic procedure that gets you the same R and SI for the same I. So if you would be reusing an I, you would be getting the same R and S, and that actually gives away a lot of information. So never ever reuse the same I. All right, with that warning, here we go. So, well, it's the same equation that we had before. So mod do 130 minus 5 and 128. So what is the forgery success? Now the fraction, the ratio of this number and that number is 2 squared, so that's 4. So before we had just a small difference, well, we had a, the number itself, we had a million, and 3, and we had minus a million. And so here we would have to look at 4 values in this direction and 4 values in this direction. You might now think it should be 9 because there's also the, the, the no addition of that number. Actually, when you do the, the fine-grained things, because it's minus 5 here, you don't get exactly this. So it's at most 4 times um, four times this. And then the number of blocks, the degree of the polynomial. So if you have L bytes in your message, then well, you're splitting it up into bit, uh, chunks of 128 bits. So 128 bits is 16 bytes. So you take the length of the message divided by 16, and okay, well, using the ceiling here because you could have some not fully full uh, block there. So that gives you the degree of the polynomial. Okay, so the forgery probability is that many roots of this big thing. So each polynomial has L over 16 degree, and then you have eight of those because of the, uh, the, diff the ratio between the 2 to the 128 and the 2 to the 130. And then the size for the R that comes in here, well, that was a million before, and it's now just the 2 to the, 100, well, it's <laughs> two to the 106, not just. Uh, that comes from the 128 with the 22 bits cleared. So if you would clear a few bits, then this part would be larger. But this is pretty large. So the uh, probability, therefore, is very, very small. And so if you're doing multiple forgeries um, and you're rejecting, you would reject them all with this probability. So each of those has an independent success chance. So if you're doing D forgeries, well, it just gets a factor of D there. And then if you're looking at something astronomically large, like or reasonably very large, to the 64, you could imagine doing that, but it's pretty large and you're looking at something which is a normal size on the internet. So this would be the number of bytes in a block. Um, then the probability that all of those get rejected is larger than 0 0.9 and okay, eventually comes to 8. 
Okay. To get you the full Poly 1305, I need to do some more specifications. Um, so, for instance, if you have variable length ciphertext, so if you can't fix it to 1536 uh, bytes, then you uh, still have to ensure that the C of X are different polynomials. So that is another dangerous thing that if you could have polynomials that match, because there would be some zero parts there, then you could use a forgery for this one um, as a valid, I mean, a valid tag for this one as a forgery for a different message. And so for that, uh, the definition of poly 5 has some more changes. And that also explains why there is such a big difference between the 128 bits and 230 bits. Namely, when we're looking at the pieces in this block, so we're splitting each of those into 16 bytes, so that's 128 bits. And then for each of those blocks, well, that's just 128 bits. So now we take a one in the lowest pos uh, in the top position. So we're adding two to the 129 to it, uh, two to the 128 to it. So that is uh, different from how I was explaining the numbers in little onion. So in big onion, this is using little onion notation. So if you now put a one in the last position, that is actually the most significant bit. So you're adding it to the 128 to it. And so for essentially all blocks, that means that your uh, representation is now, when you look at it as an integer, is a number in this range. The last block can be shorter. It still has to be, well, byte aligned. So you're not seeing every length there or every number there. So you're still adding a, say, 2 to the 9, uh, 2 to the 8, or 2 to the 16. Okay, and now the poly 5 is actually defined with these CIJ bars, not with the CIJ as before. So the I was just the message number, and then the um, the bar comes from the um, append the one there. Okay, so the definition of the message tag then is in this notation, you're taking the first one times R to the K, next one to R to the K minus one, etc. Where k is defined as the length over 16, well, li bytes in the ith message. Um, and so these are actually 129 bit message uh, pieces. So the difference is somewhat smaller than you would think up here. And so this also modifies the message so that you're avoiding the clashes of numbers. Okay, so this is the full specification uh, of poly 1305. And we have now seen, well, the probability that somebody could get in a forgery is small. Depends, of course, on the length of the message. If you have longer messages, that means that the L gets larger. That has some influence on the, on the probability there. But the 2 to the 106 is really a large number. And therefore, the forgery probability is very, very small. Okay, again, let me repeat the warning. Never reuse the same I. And other than that, well, Polythene 5 is in the internet as an RFC, so this is one of the things we're actually using for real.